Well, thank you. Um, it's been brilliant, brilliant experience being here and, and to hear everybody's talk and all the amazing work everyone's doing. It's fantastic, a real inspiration. And one of the lucky things on going a bit later in a presentation is you get to draw on other people's ideas. And even in, as the last speaker, I was kind of thinking, oh, there's some things I wanted to say and, and bring in. Um, what I will talk about is the London Knowledge Lab. I, I want to let you sort of hear a bit about all the work. There's some great work going on there. Uh, a lot of interdisciplinary research. We class ourselves, as Katerina mentioned yesterday, we, um, we draw from both the Institute of Education and Computer Science, and we're putting a building together, and uh, we collaborate on various projects, and it's quite exciting, it's quite contentious, it's quite argumentative at times, it's great fun, it's a great creative environment to be in. So I'm gonna talk a bit about interdisciplinary research and, and what that means. A lot of work, a lot of the project and work that comes out from that, has been built in a program that was local to the UK called Technology Enhanced Learning, a program that was funded. And Richard Noss of the lab, he um, has directed that five-year program. And um, we've had a lot of great and positive results. And some of them I'll be able to talk a little bit about, um, about how that works within the lab and what that means. And a lot of the work I've been doing this year has been working on what we call the London, London Knowledge Lab Innovation. And it's a way where we want to bring true cross-collaboration from academia, from students, from teachers, and from industry. We want to bring everybody together to be working towards leveraging all the brilliant work that everybody does and building on that and having an impact. And as everybody has talked about throughout all the presentations, you need people to collaborate and to communicate and exchange their ideas bring that together. It's not easy, it's challenging often, but it's very rewarding and it's great. It's, gr it's great fun to do. You learn so much because you start to learn about the domains around you that are different to the way you think. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. The research in action is actually, that's about, well, actually we've got what the research says, but how can we have a look, a little view of what research in action is? And we we turned education, collaborative education, on its head and we ran a hackathon about education and learning. And how did we do that with students? We took students on a journey for a few months, brought them together with teachers, with industry, with academics, with people from all over, and we had a, a really brilliant experience. An experience that you couldn't normally see in a day-to-day -day classroom and learning that took place that is only possible through collaborative exchange. And I'll show you a little bit about that. And the research and practice going forward, what that might mean. Um, but one of the interesting things, before I continue, you know, it was interesting from the Fab Lab when they're talking about the Industrial Revolution and what changed for us. When we were working recently on some work, um, Suboff is somebody I, I, I came to meet. I've got a computer science background. Um, when I studied computer science, you also studied sociology, funnily enough, and very interdisciplinary. For me, it's natural, you know, and everybody's an interdisciplinary thinker, really, but we forget. And she was trying to understand something about what was changing, and that, of course, was the time when technology was coming in. She was interested in the Industrial Revolution, but she couldn't get information on that. And so, suddenly in front of her, there was this technology revolution taking place in the workplace. And she went into different factories, and she saw people who no longer could do their job. They, that suddenly their job was in this machine, that they somehow innately had understood all their lives, and, and they had to push a button, and they didn't know what to do. And they were given these machines. And you, you, there's loads of case studies that say, well, actually, technology came in, and it, was, it didn't work. And people didn't know how to connect to it, and didn't know what that meant, and what it meant to them, and how to change their thinking. It was a big transformation. 
and she went all over and she went to, and she saw the, this happen again and again. So why do we think about it now, right at this point? Well, technology in itself is going through its own revolution, that it's, it's coming out at a huge pace. And education is time. And teachers are being challenged, uh, schools are being challenged, especially in the UK. You know, what, what, what are we doing? What are we going to do? And what are we going to do with this thing called computer science and all those kind of things? And what are we going to do about learning and digital literacies? All that's coming out right now and causing all kinds of new ways of thinking about things, possibly. Um, but it's another space where the teacher's job has been in a particular role for a long time. And now we're saying, well, how are we going to bring this together? And we really don't want to be faced with the same problems we've been faced in the past, where people no longer feel empowered to do their jobs. We want teachers, learners, and society to be empowered. And not just a few people. We want a lot of people to be empowered. So that's kind of, for me, I always, whenever I think about this, I think about that. It's about sharing collaborative knowledge. No one person can know the, all the answers. We have to be able to ask the right questions. And we have to be smart about that. And then there's another point from the speaker who was, who was talking just before me. And uh, Astra said something about we're going back to building stuff. And that's also critical to us. Um, and you'll see a bit later on something about the create and discover strategy. And I was thinking about this uh, a philosopher that you'll all know, Kierkegaard, the either or. Um, I mean, he, he had a view, it was, you know, aesthetics. Well, you know, if you go down the aesthetics route, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't give you back that satisfaction that you, you need. If you go down the moral route, it's very hard to live by the moral route only. And so, you know, he made his view about why God should exist. Well, I make the view of why we have to build and create. We've got to be connected to the things. We feel very good about ourselves when we can build and understand something. And that's critical. You mentioned yesterday the psychology of flow. And, you know, that psychology of flow and creativity, being in that mode, feeling, contributing, that sort of, in the gaming industry, epic win, you're going to get to that point that amazing feeling. And that's what we want to bring back together. And that's why I think a lot of these collaborative hackathons that come together, come together because people do build something. We, we're human beings. We like to socialize. We like to share. And we want to build on the work of others. So I think it's important to remember, Zubos saw something where people you know, lost all of their sense of who they were. And really, we're in a position to look at history, not relive it, and build a different history, future for ourselves and the people that follow us. So, as I was saying, coming a little bit back to the, to the lab, um, I, I mean, I'm just a true believer in disciplinary thinking. Why, why somebody wouldn't? Wouldn't be a researcher, want to know about other things, understand it, lateral thinking, bring that together. It's brilliant. It's a great experience. You learn loads, and you get to meet all kinds of extraordinary people, like at this event. Young learners are great interdisciplinary thinkers. So I took two examples recently. Um, I've shown a nine-year-old uh, a little video off YouTube about quantum mechanics, and it was about observing electrons. And then a bit later, he said, it's like when a tree falls in a forest, if no one's there, no one knows it makes a noise. And I thought, well, that was pretty amazing. He made that lateral link. We, we all should make them and use them, their creative powers. I was showing a six-year-old. I was doing some work with some six- to nine-year-olds. And I showed them the motherboard. And I said, to, and what do you, I didn't tell them what it was. I just said, what, is, you know, what do you think this is? And she said, oh, it's a city. It looks like a city. And I love that because it is a city. And then I could talk to her about it. So young learners are interdisciplinary thinkers. So when we step into a room with learners, we should hopefully be stepping in interdisciplinary thinkers to interdisciplinary researchers. So take that on board. What does the London Knowledge Lab do with all of that? Well, we work with people across all 
disciplines of teaching and education and age groups from the very young to those to adult learners. And we really believe in the teachers and the learners being centre stage to anything that we're delivering and giving to them. So they're always participation and collaboration. We don't just look, I mean, I've talked a lot about the technology enhanced learning because that's where I'm based and how I think and what I'm working in, but there's a lot of other work that goes on. There's a lot of work on media and culture, looking at filming, looking at how when you give a student a, a film, a camera for a week, what they're going to film, what's important to them, what their narrative is, and bringing that back in, looking at multimodal exchanges, what they are. We look at gaming, people, how do games incorporate and how does, can they be used to deliver and work with what do they mean in education. We always think about theory. We do put pedagogy primarily at the heart of many things we do and try to understand how to articulate that to people. And we do work with, with teachers in practice to try to see how they understand it, what their understanding is, and how to bring that together. And we work with computer science. Um, I'm smiling because it's my favorite subject. Um, and I love AI. I think it's a great field. But, uh, and we do lots of different things. And we don't see that technology is going to take over the world and you know, replace teachers. And we don't want it just to do the thinking for the, uh, for the teachers. We, we want to empower the teachers and the students and get, you know, give people access to knowledge so that they can get to where they want to get to and have a good experience and build on that. So that's kind of where we, we sit with that. We look at things like context to where, you know, what does that mean to the user and how they're going to put those things together. So that the lab works, lots of different projects, and we bring lots of different things together. We are very big believers in reuse and not reinventing the wheel if we can. And we really like to be able to give things to the community so that they can reuse them and build on those tools and, and they have an impact. So we've been quite lucky in, in ways of that, working with teachers. But going in, I mean, going in as a computer scientist with a teacher, what you find that happens is often they'll say, well, I, I don't need that tool. It's not for me. So I was working on the learn designer to help them uh, build designs that they could then share with other teachers. And, um, it's, you know, I don't need that. I've been using a pen and paper and the usual thing. And you have to go, you have to talk to them and say, well, what we'd like to do is enable you to collaborate all your great thinking with all these other teachers and to share those experiences and then to be able to build. And once you get people involved and incorporated, collaborative exchanges happen. So it's important, but there still are barriers. It's not, it's not an easy route, um, but it's a better route in certain ways. You get a lot more out of it. So I'm going to look at certain projects, and I've kind of partitioned these off a bit. They're called collaboration and learning. So we have a little project, well, no, not so little, but it was the one about, and I call it me, myself. So it's really about the individual, the independent learner on their own. Um, oh. Recap, do you know anything about how we make these curtains so we can actually see Patricia's presentation? No, because I haven't figured out how the sun moves. Um, All right. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so, but I, I don't think I can kind of transfer that to moving the curtains. Whatever I do, it seems to make it worse. Okay, guys, you have to help me. Is this a bit yeah, that's like better. this? <coughs> ah, amazing, thank you. So one, one of the things, so one, a, a little example is um, students have sometimes have difficulty in learning how to tell the time. I'm not talking about six-year-olds here. I'm talking about 12-year-olds 12, 12 have difficulties. They haven't quite mastered what's going on. Uh, so one of the projects was to look at, well, why was that? So lots of tell-the-time applications. And it was actually the way that the feedback came, came back to the student. 
and they would, um, uh, what tell the time was it was just say, well, uh, actually, uh, well, you know, you've hit this time, um, that's not right, or here's the right time. What this did was, it was a visual, give you a clock. It says, I'd like you to make the clock tell this time. So the student will try and get it to tell that time. And then when it failed, it gave them contextual feedback, very simple, and said, it's this, this time. You know, you haven't quite got the right time. But it didn't, it didn't say you haven't got the right time. It just told you what time you had given it. So then the student was being scaffolded. Um, so it's kind of in that way that we, we try to work and um, how to get the students to be able to look at what they're doing, um, not tell them, well, that's absolutely wrong, all right. And a number of students were able to come out. I finally got it, finally understood it. Very simple thing. Probably for years, people have been drilling clocks at them and saying, well, you know, and now that you're 11 or 12, why can't you tell the time? Which is not very helpful. Um, but, you know, this was able to turn things around. So we do things like that. We work with, with students who have certain difficulties um, on, pra on practical everyday things, really, because you need to be able to tell the time. Uh, to be able to do various, at least turn up. <laughs> um, this is the, the, the type of project that Katarina was talking about, the tech team, about being eco-friendly. And look at the, your energy habits and things like that. That's really about the independent user, you can think of it in terms of that. You can think about it in the bigger picture as well. But what are my habits and how can I improve those? And you can then think about, well, how can I share those ideas to encourage my friends and family around me? And one of the things about the ECHOES project that Katerina talked about was that really the, the parents also wanted to be able to have an, they had an investment in their children that had certain learning disabilities. So they, they want to be able to hook into that. And that's one of the things that ECHOES has brought out, is this parent aspect and need to incorporate the parent into education. And it's another part of the collaboration. Don't forget who your sources are in your projects when you're building things. You know, So it, they're very important. And what we see that is also centre stage. Patricia, yeah. I was saying that's that's so extremely interesting because whenever we work with uh, interactive in the city space and museums, we build in a parent uh, sibling relationship and maybe a child grandparent mm. because we know they go there together. So we know they're the people coming. But actually, in a learning situation, a normal kind of biological would be the family system teaching the kid until nine ten when their their kind of attention starts getting elsewhere. That's where kids normally start looking at people around them mm -hmm. for value sets. But until then, it's a family very much, yeah. or cousins uh, that, that defines value sets. Yeah. Uh, or that's what we know from gaming research, kind of what, what actually uh, makes them choose a game or not a game. Or yeah. and, and that means that when we have the school system today, we actually split up that normal learning situation. Uh, and we do that for many good reasons, but we still need to figure out then how do we Connect them back in. Yeah, connect them back in. And that's also the discussion we are having in general in Europe is that it used to be the parents' fault when people didn't learn mm. like 10 or 20 years ago. Today, we blame the teachers. Yeah. So it's very interesting, This where, where is the responsibility? Uh, I mean, I think learning? you're right. Up to the age of 9 or 10, the biggest influence on your child's life is in general is the parents, is the close ties, as you might think. And, and it's true. And they're a huge source of knowledge. And, you know, you see parents and they go through various projects and they say, you know, I've just been on the internet helping my child develop some project. I found all these resources and I'd really like to share them somehow back to... I don't want the parents next year having to go through the same thing. And they're a very good validator of knowledge. I mean, it's, it's not easy for all parents to do all those things, but in the UK, for sure, parents have a big investment in the schools a lot of times and big push. And a lot of things are pushed from the parents. So often that separation is to kind of try to not have so much of a push, but there is a need for a sort of communication. And then on the other hand, parents are afraid of how to be involved. And technology can act as either a barrier, I don't know what that computer thing is or how to work it, or an engager. Well, I, well let's have a look. Let's find out how to do that. And, it, you know, so it's true. It, 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 and I, I think it's a real critical... If we 
you know, think about today's education, parents can play a huge role and then have a huge investment. And certainly when the children have difficulties or, you know, like dietary issues where they have allergies and so on, they need more support because it's a bigger challenge for you and, and for the community to, to enable, to ensure that the child is supported. There's more worries, I think, on that. So this is just the community. So sorry, oh, I was going to, I didn't, what I didn't talk about, sorry, a bit distracted there, um, was the MyGen, which is a maths tool, um, which helps students learn uh, how to do algebra. And uh, again, it was changing the way the representation of visualization, so the normal practice for teachers, and it was working with teachers in schools. And it also helped the teachers form groups so that the, the students could do different kinds of collaboration over problems that they wanted to solve. And the, the other project, one that I talked a little bit about yesterday, was the Learning Designer. And that really was about a tool for teachers, for teachers, you know, for teachers to build their own knowledge co-construction. And that we use the, the semantic web tools, ontologies, and inferencing systems to enable to put an underlying model that talked in their language that they could use. Um, and getting to their language is quite interesting in interdisciplinary research because we've talked a lot about communication, and communication is difficult. People have different ways of talking about things. And I, I have to say, in pedagogy, in the social sciences, in education, they must have the biggest vocabulary of all of talking about similar things with different terminology. So it's a very interesting area. But that's where you need a flexibility in your tools to help the teachers so that they can express in their terms and relate to the terms of others and help that connection so that that sharing can happen. So it is, it is critical. So I think in every walk of life, we all have to face a lot of interdisciplinary work. So, oh, have I got five minutes? Okay, I've got to go a lot faster then. Well, I'm just going to flick through these. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say very much. Basically, so on the one hand, you have the scenarios and the tools of where the they can help you. But underneath that, there's a lot of data. And people are really now concerned with what they call the big data. And that's why a lot of these um, different kinds of tools, knowledge tools, are needed. But they're not just needed in terms of helping students to learn or help teachers get access to knowledge and information and change, not from visualization. We actually need to know how to, to design and build algorithms like that ourselves as students coming through. They will not be in the future, if not in fact now, um, subjects that are not affected by that. So, you know, it really is required that you have to embrace certain things about technology because the data is out there. Stephanie was talking about all this data in government that they want to, that's not going away, that's just going to get bigger, and more of it, and different types. So I'm not going to say anything more about that, because um, all about that, that's a scenario through of how you connect all the things up and how it might look, of collaborative learning, because I want to get to what the London Lodge Lab says, because I want to show you a little video about the stuff that we did at the Hack event. Um, so what the, what the research says has been set up in April this year, and we've run a number of bi-monthly events where we bring people in from all over, and come and have a, we do different presentations, we have discussions, and we look at demos, and it's a great forum for collaboration exchange. And uh, the research in action was something that we took on to say, how can we get students to um, think about think about their learning. So this is a collaboration model I'm looking at time. And think about learning and work collaboratively and come up with ideas that they would like to see solved and how they might use technology to do that and where it might fit in. Where might technology help them? And um, one of the things we think about is collaboratively creating to discover strategy, so externalizing. And I've seen that to me, that's this whole of this hack event here has been about that externalizing and putting things together. And um, I just have to understand, but so the whole collaborative crazy movement, we can see that we can actually take that up to a bigger level and make it a strategic tool. Because this kind of processes or decisions would normally be taken by a government or by a regional uh, fund or whatever. Hmm. So it's this kind of work methods create whole new ways 
of how regions, companies, etc., uh, make strategies. But well, this that, but it's also a fundamental thing. What you said at the end of the last presentation was that you know having hands-on building, externalizing, it's really critical, and and that's why a lot of things. You know, we feel more satisfied when we we create something. I mean, it's obvious when someone says it. But it's, it's really what educate. If you watch a child, and in fact, this is what happened. I went into schools, and I had these nice shiny Arduinos and things for them to play with, or mobile phones, or two. And they didn't really want, initially didn't want to listen to me. They wanted to play with the tool, when they get hands on. Then you get hands on, and then you say, right, okay, now I've got to show you a few things and talk about it. And I went on quite a journey, um, which involved a trust, taking risk, me not being able to answer all their questions because they're all doing different things, but saying, you have to find an answer and how we're going to do that. So it's, that's really, it's critical, just on a fundamental individual level. I love building things and creating things and making new things and sharing things and hearing about other people's things and seeing what other people are doing. That's why I think this is an amazing experience here. And what we do, because we know we're contributing to something bigger than ourselves, and I think that's that's important to a lot of the psychology. I think that's a lot about the, the creativity you've talked about, flowing games, the epic win, the next step, the big thing, and then sharing it. So, I have. You know, so this was what I call turning collaborative learning on its head, because we put the student centre stage and we validated the student. We said to the student, "Your ideas are important." and we're all gonna work with you, and we think they're great. So we, we ended up with six schools, about 50 students, and they all did different things. And we had someone do you choose, where they were, a group of them wanted to redesign the curriculum, and you choose what you wanted to learn that week. We had one doing RFID tags, uh, this group working on, on how to link up students and teachers in different ways, and tracking, and so on. We had the e-diary experience, which where the students wanted to have a diary. They didn't want a paper diary, they wanted an electronic diary, and they wanted to build it in a particular way that told them the information, tasks for them. We had a group of students who, um, with teachers and experts come together and say, well, we want to build something that um, helps teachers be <laughs> manage their time better. They don't overload us so much, and they mark our work so we can get our feedback. And it was great, because everybody was working on quite a collaborative way. Then we had, this was the um, part of the, the physical computing, where they built a little sort of, a kind of like a weather station, really, and uh, it sensed sort of measured rain and different things. And that, that was great, they put that together. And the final one were the people who used a role-playing uh, tool to build educational stuff um, based on history. And that, it, was it was brilliant. They all did a fantastic job. And afterwards, they all had to go and present. Now, I can't show the presentation, actually, that where they go and present in front of about, I don't know, three or 400 people, uh, what they've done. I can't show you that because it's too long. But um, I can show you a little bit of the video that we had some people take. So a couple of, well, sorry, in two minutes. But, um, so, should hopefully give you an idea. six schools with great ideas about how you can use technology to support learning. Lots of volunteers from the London Knowledge Lab and from SMEs and startups in London and even some big companies as well, including the BBC, come here to help those students make their ideas into something, to hack, to build, to use technology, to communicate those ideas about how they think technology can help them to learn better in school, at home, wherever they happen to be. It's quite strange and that the concept and process of education hasn't really changed that much in, well, 150 years. What makes this project so special that you travelled so far? It's not that common that you bring together kids and students and teachers and researchers to reinvent their future, reinvent how they want education. That's about it. Let's go have lunch. Are you enjoying what you're doing? 
uh, yeah, it's really fun and it's great to work with uh, people who know what they're doing and also my friends. Sometimes. <laughs> so hopefully this, uh, this bit of hardware will help schools to be able to set up a remote monitoring station and then look at all the data back in, in the school. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of challenges. <laughs> Then the, yes, the students went on to present. We, we took them down to the big uh, London Festival of Education and they had their 15 minute slot and it was amazing. It's really fantastic. They did a great job. So, uh, this was just say how to get involved. We do lots of things. So, if anyone wants to come and get involved with us, please do come along. One of the things we're trying to launch from the Hack event is a young computer science online journal for computer scientists. That's what we want to do. We want those stories to come out and be brought. And we're talking about the younger uh, students. So from, uh, well, any age that feels able, from six, let's say, to 18, but I suspect it'll be secondary school. And that validates, that tells them that we're listening and we're interested. And that encourages that investment into bringing their ideas together. So this is one of the things I wanted to finish off with. Um, challenges thinking uh, about interdisciplinary thinking. You have to understand multiple perspectives and why they're important. You have to be prepared to listen to other people, struggle with their terminology and their ideas and the thing they're trying to bring you, which is not exactly what you were hoping they were going to bring you many times. Um, understanding the risks. Uh, the talk yesterday talked about failure. Yeah, there's many times, but the innovation and the creativity and change and shaping the future is amazing. You know, the change that we saw from the hack event, the lead up through that, just the process and the things that came back, fantastic. And that's happening, that's what's happening today. Having a vision of how things can be changed and taking on those challenges, don't be afraid. There's no point, You've, you know, you have to live it now, you can't live it. And it's collaborative interdisciplinary thinking and research. And I wanted to, at the end of some of the talks, was put up uh, the media equation, because you're talking again about being connected to things, and when we're talking about the, di the diabetics video, of how people could associate to other ways of information. The knowledge analytics and the visualization of that is critical for people to understand, because not everybody's going to be researching and interdisciplinary thinkers or computational thinkers, and it's our job to uh, give that data and information back to people who aren't in the position to, to think and have access to that. So thank you, that's the end of my talk. Let's take a question to Patricia. Who's got a question? Then Tiffany. Thanks very much. Obviously, incredibly interested in your work, Patricia, and that of uh, London Knowledge Labs. I wanted to pick up on one of the last statements you shared, which is about the, the journal. Um, and I wanted to know if uh, there's any uh, endeavour by the London Knowledge Labs, particularly, um, to do more than the journal in that respect. Um, well, it's ongoing. I mean, we're, do we're doing more with the students. I mean, we're always working with the students and the teachers. But... Um, yeah, I mean, one of the other things is, uh, is the follow-on. Uh, because one of the, the results that came from the event that we did were parents were really interested in what had happened. They, they got to see videos. I mean, video, I mean, video's been around forever. But when a parent sees their student standing up presenting and they're going, I didn't know my child was that mature, you know, and things, it changes a lot. And they're all asking, we want to see, we want more of that. That's what, we're, you know, the our children are here for, in some sense, not ne not for everything. Um, so the other thing is we want to bring them back in to present uh, what well, I want to bring them back in. I have to maybe convince some people that to come and tell us about what the research to the what the research says, what it was, being a student in that experience and what they did um, as part of that, and to continue. And I'd like them um, to then be mentors to be part of the program that continues on from that and build up that community. Because, uh, because I, I think what you, what you have found with working with lots, you know, you, put, you suddenly don't, the students realise that it's, 
It's not strange what they're doing. They're not isolated. There's lots of people. And that changes everything. You feel you can go and you can do more things and you learn so much from each other. It's so fantastic. So, yeah, we, we, we're planning to do more. We will um, be doing was a discussion to do another particular hack event at the same time next year with the London Festival of Education. But also there are other people who are interested in putting such collaborations, things together. But I'd like to see, I mean, in the UK, I'd like to see a curriculum change where you can plan in those kind of events in, for the schools so that lots of schools can get access to that kind of experience. And I, actually, I actually think when we look at it, uh, I started making learning games back when I was 17 or 16 because I was taught about politics by a blackboard. And you don't understand a political system or why you should vote by knowing how many parties are in your country, how old are they, what were their traditional values. You learn by simulating and playing. So we started doing role-playing on our own to learn about political system. Then I turned that into learning games and we start distributing. But what you're saying here, and now, now I'm kind of summing up on all the, f the labs we've seen. We've seen the Fab Lab from Amsterdam. We've seen the Fab Labs um, from Barcelona. And we've seen the London Knowledge Lab. And if I sum up on that, I started do going to this field for doing interactive experiences. But to me, it more and more looks like interactive societies. Everything we see is people starting, and I would actually say, you know, Marx was right, but he didn't know. Uh, the production materials and the production machinery does belong to the people today. And we've seen people create their own films and really eat a lot of films and stories. And in the narrative field, if you catch up from yesterday, we see people see more and more films. And we know when people need stories, it's about identity and culture. And now there's another movement, which is a whole kind of creators, makers movement. And that to me is a very beautiful balance. So we both have a bigger need for story. All of you watch more than one film a week. We mm. used to see maybe one film a week, maybe two. Most people watch three or four, some even more, if you don't see TV series or short. So the kind of consumption of culture gone up, but also the kind of uh, level of engagement people have in creative things have done so as well. So it's a very interesting mix when we put the tendencies together. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I like the, the project when you were talking about yesterday that you're, you're spinning out with the idea of, um, you know, the drama, music, narratives to explain, you know, sort of digital footprints within the world around us or within my local area mm. as a new way. Because, I mean, I, you know, I'm quite happy reading dense data that looks obscure because that's what I've had to do for a lot of years but a lot of people aren't you know it's like a form blindness mm. and having other means of representations and they can get access to it which is why the the video about the diabetes I thought was just so pertinent I mean that just clinched it really you can just see well look at that transformation mm. yeah Alex's uh, project where diabetes and you don't just see a number now it's your count to high or to low but you see a color value so it compares you to something. That's why we I have to let people yeah. have uh, some lunch, I think. Uh, as you know, we are running a little bit late. Uh, so quarter past we start.